first off, pause the video. They've been, I think I need to get further away. They've been copying that slide. Pause the video and get it copied. Yesterday, we went to a dark room and uh, looked at how electrons could create light, right? Um, that's going to be one of the big focuses on your eventual exam on Friday the 13th. Um, we'll do one other thing with light, which is that there's some calculations you can do. If you remember, at the end of that lecture, we compared energy, wavelength, and frequency together. Um, there's some math you can apply there to really not only say, oh, well, if one goes up, the other goes down, but by how much numerically. We're not worried about that yet. That'll be the very end of the unit. Instead, we're going to slightly change gears and look at the other main focus of electrons that I want you to know, which is what's referred to as their configuration. So... We know already that the center of an atom is called the nucleus. You've already been tested over that idea. And we also know that there are circles, orbitals, pathways, where the electrons exist out here. That's all from last unit, just some basic atom anatomy. What we're going to do today is say, well, what if I wanted to know more information on him, on that specific electron? Well, there's a variety of info that you could find about him <coughs> that might different, differentiate him from other electrons that are spinning around that nucleus. One of the things is he could have a number, maybe a number two, which would tell you the amount of energy that he has. Now, it doesn't have to be a number two. Um, what are the, what's the range of numbers that electron could have? What through what? What? One through seven. All right, you know that because you just wrote it. It was on the opening slide. Um, so yeah, it could be any number one through seven. And the higher the number, the more energy that electron contains. Another thing that we could use to describe that electron is a letter. Maybe he has the letter P. The letter is going to refer to the way that the electron is moving around that nucleus. There's S, P, D, and F getting more complex in that order, as you can see on the opening slide. And they get more and more complex <laughs> as you go up the letters. Like the S shapes are just spheres, electrons just spinning in a circle, where when electrons enter the P shape or um, electron cloud shape is another phrase we use, the P does a figure eight, which is kind of cool. The D does figure eight, figure eight slapped on top of each other. So those electrons get to have a really good time. And then the Fs are just absolutely wild what they can do. We don't really study F electron clouds at this level of chemistry, but hopefully someday for you. <coughs> So again, the letter that is assigned to describing this electron describes the orbital shape that he is existing on, and it just gets a little bit more fun of a roller coaster for the electron as you go down that list. So there's some of your initial vocab on electron description is numbers for energy, letters for shape.
What I need you to be able to do is if I give you an element, I want you to be able to tell me all of its electrons configurations in regards to the numbers and the letters. And that's the skill that we're gonna go over today. <coughs> in order to help us do that, I've handed you out this sheet. All right, this sheet is your buddy. Now, for those of you at home, um, this lecture is a bit more challenging without this sheet. Um, you could Google it if you Googled electron configuration cheat sheet or something like that. You might be able to find it, but otherwise, get a copy from me. But I'll be that they'll be looking at this and it will be making their life a lot easier. Now, I gave you another regular periodic table on the back of it. And we'll be referencing that sheet heavily today. I want you to notice how on the opening slide, there's a number of orbitals associated with the sublevels, right? With those letters are called sublevels. I think I said that. You wrote it down there. Um, do you see how the numbers increase in a way that you would expect? Since that F shape is, of course, the craziest, it contains the most circles, pathways, orbitals in that area, which is why the F has seven orbitals. Well, if you go back to the simple sphere, the S is just that one orbital. With that said, we can bring all of this together to do a configuration of an element. Are you excited? First off, what we're doing today is called orbital notation. So this next part you'll want to label in your notes as orbital notation. <coughs> and you can do this for any element we're going to do it for three today to get in some good practice. So let's start with fluorine. Fluorine is going to be the first element that we configure. Now, remember, you have a periodic table handy, right? A real one because it's on the back of the sheet I gave you. So you'll want to be flipping back and forth as I ask my little questions. It's the electrons we're configuring. So it would kind of make sense for the first question I ask myself if I want to focus on fluorine to be, well, how many electrons does fluorine have? Somebody yell it out. Look at fluorine. How many? Nine. Nine. Because we learned last unit that the number of electrons are equal to the number of protons and the number of protons are equal to the atomic number. So fluorine has nine electrons that we need to label the energy levels numbers and the sublevels letters. There's some rules to help us do this in regard to getting these electrons labeled in order. And they were on the slide before this one, so look back at your opening notes. And we're going to start with my friend Offball. You see how you wrote down off-ball? Off-ball's rule states that whenever you're going to configure an element, you're always going to start in the lowest energy level, which is always going to be 1s. Because 1 is the lowest number you can have, and s is the simplest shape you can have, right? One's the lowest number, one through seven. S is the smallest letter, S through F. <clears throat> now we have to know something about the S sublevel. I need to know how many circles, how many orbitals exist in S. What's the answer? How many orbitals does an S hold? The answer is one. Now, if you're like, I didn't know that. Yes, you did. Go back to the opening slide. You wrote it down. Verify. Does everybody see that S can have one orbital? Awesome. We are going to represent orbitals by drawing flat lines. Every time 
I draw a flat line like that, that's going to represent an orbital. So we're starting at 1s. We said that s has one orbital. So that's going to be just one of those lines. There's another rule on the opening slide, which is Polly's rule. What does Polly say? Two electrons of opposite spin can fit in an orbital. Now there's a lot of information there, so let's, let's break it apart. First off, Polly tells you how many electrons there are in each orbital. How many are there? Two, a max of two. Every flat line that we draw can fit a maximum of two electrons. Now, if we're gonna keep doing this pretty little picture, you need to know what I'm gonna draw to represent electrons. I'm gonna use arrows. Here's what my arrows are gonna look like. That's an arrow for me. And every arrow is gonna represent an electron. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, that's not an arrow, an arrow is supposed to look like that. I agree, but you're gonna be drawing hundreds of arrows. So if you don't draw one of the flags, it will save you a little bit of wrist movement overall. How many electrons can fit in that orbital? Two. Polly says two. Polly says something else, though. Not only can I put two electrons there, there's one of them, right? Because that's an electron. There's one of them. What's true about the way they spin? They spin in opposite directions, which means on that circle, one of them is spinning like this, and on the same circle, the other one is spinning like that. Opposite directions. What do you think I could do with my imagery here to show that the other electron is spinning the other way? I could point the arrow down. All right, so I've got one arrow pointing up, I've got one arrow pointing down, which is representing the two electrons that are there spinning in opposite directions. Cool, right? And now I've labeled, I've identified some of the stuff about these two electrons. These two electrons have an energy of one and are living in a cloud shape in sublevel of S. How many electrons have I drawn total? Two, I've drawn two. How many am I supposed to draw for fluorine? Nine. Nine. So I know I have to keep going. Let me rephrase that question. Whose orbital notation is this? Which element on the table have we drawn the orbital notation for? Helium. Yeah, because if you look at your table, helium only has two electrons, and there they are. But we don't get to stop at helium's configuration because we're doing fluorine. And here's where your cheat sheet here is going to help you out. We need to keep going in our configuration. And here's what this does for you. You're going to read this the way you read a book. You stop in that you start in the top left and you're going to read to the end of lines. Every time you hit a new section, right, which if you look <coughs> is sectioned off by energy levels and sublevels. Then you're going to write it down and go through this same thought process that we went through for the first step. How long do you do it for? Well, until you get, in this case, to fluorine, to his square, because that's who we're configuring. So let me ask you this. If 1s is always where we start, because that's what off-ball says, what comes after 1s if you read this sheet like a book. Now, don't say 1s. I know what you're saying. That's helium, all right? That's hydrogen and helium. They're both 1s. What comes after 1s? It's 2s. Do you see how after you get to the end of the 1s line, you hit 2s next? All right? So after 1s always comes 2s.
And now my questions start to get kind of monotonous and repeating. How many orbitals fit in an S? One, all right? Now remember, there's no reason to blank out on that. Go to the opening slide, it tells you. S is one, P is three, D is five, F is seven. You need to know that. But for right now, you're just learning it. But yeah, S has one orbital. How many electrons fit in one orbital? Two, according to Pauli but make sure that you spin them opposite directions. I've drawn one, two, three, four electrons. I'm supposed to draw nine, so we are not done. Let's keep going. Read it like a book. What comes after 2s? Yeah, 2p or not to pee, depends on how much you've drank. Huh. Shakespeare. Yeah, after 2s comes 2p. Does everyone see where I'm getting that expression? Same questions, different area. How many orbitals fit in a p? Three. Does everyone see where we're getting the number three from? So draw all three of them. Watch, watch, watch. Here's how it looks. There's the three orbitals that fit in a P because the electron cloud in that P area of the atom is moving in a figure eight and it's a little more wild. Hey, if I were to completely fill up those orbitals, how many electrons would I draw? Just those three. If I were to completely fill them, it would fit six, right? Because every orbital can hold two. So that'd be two, four, six. If I drew six on top of those four, how many would I have drawn total? Too many, right? Because six plus four is 10 and I want nine. So you've got to keep count as you go because there's a finish line here, fluorine, for this example. So don't fill them all the way up, but there's one more rule. Look at the last rule on the opening slide, HUND. HUND says something kind of interesting. HUND says if you're filling multiple orbitals in a, in a set position, that the electrons enter singly in each before doubling up. What does that mean? Here's what it means. As these electrons go in, they're not gonna go up, down, up, down, up. They're gonna go up, up, up. One electron in each orbital before they start doubling. Now, if you're like, well, sir, what if they're going down, down, down? Sure, I don't care. That doesn't matter, all right? This is just kind of textbook, but they could go down, down, down. Up, up, up. How many more do I need to draw still? How many more, how many more? Just two more. Down, down, stop. Now, if you're wondering why that happens, why do they go singly before doubly? Turns out electrons hate each other, like they really hate each other, all right? like when you, two of your ex-girlfriends show up at the same party, right? They're going to go to different rooms instead of hanging out together, right? Unless you're in a lot of trouble. Um, why do electrons hate each other? There's a very simple reason why they do. Because why? Because, because not, not, it's not just because they're negative. It's because they're both negative. You know how opposites attract? What do like charges do? They repel is what you're looking for. But yeah, negative particles hate negative particles they naturally push away from each other. So if you have all this open space for the electrons to spread out at first, then they do. This is the orbital notation for fluorine, and we're done. And now you can tell a whole bunch about his electrons, right? If I was like, hey, tell me about him. You'd be like, well, he's spinning upward in the second orbital in the 2p area. It's got an energy of two and a dumbbell shape of his cloud. 
Lots of cool info, right? You'll talk about it on Saturday night, just wait. All right, let's do another one from scratch. We'll draw some cards this time. Aspen's out there, we'll get you involved. All right, here we go. The next element we're gonna do is titanium. That sounds fun. <coughs> Let's do the orbital notation for titanium. And let's go over to cluster two and talk to C1. Hey, two one, how many electrons does titanium have? He's kind of middle left, TI. 22. Everybody see where the number 22 comes from. All right, so right now we know for sure that we're going to be drawing 22 arrows. Now, real quick, don't work ahead of me yet. There's no reason to do it. Look here, I want to give you a little tip. If I give you elements that are further down the table, it gets really annoying, right? Like if I ask you to draw the orbital notation for Nobelium, then you have to draw 102 arrows. It's fun. It's a really pretty page of arrows. But the annoying thing is keeping count. Like you get, you're like, oh wait, how many do I have now? And you're like, 73, I need how many more? And then you like forget and you're like, oh, okay, how many do I have now, 94? You don't have to do that. Look, 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 I want you to, I want you to compare this table to the real table. You got it on the back, compare them. First off, do you notice how there's a square for every square? Do you see that? Find titanium square them. I want you to look at the real table, then look at the cheat table, and put your finger on titanium square. Somebody yell out what block your finger is in. With a, I, I want a number and a letter. What block are, are you in? You're in 3D, all right? That tells you that your configuration ends in 3D. So at least you know where to stop and you don't have to keep counting. If titanium is in the 3D block, then his orbital notation ends in the 3D block. So it's not a bad thing to look at before you start. But let's do this. You ready? Orbital notation for titanium. Let's go ask somebody a question. Let's go over to cluster one and talk to seat five. Hey, one five, where do we always start? You were, you were right twice with one S. All right. You always start with 1s because off ball says so. Let's go to cluster 5 and talk to seat 3. Hey, 5-3. Five, three. How many orbitals fit in an s? One from the opening slide. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's go over to cluster 5 again. And talk to seat four, Aspen. Hey, Aspen, how many electrons fit in that orbital? It's all right. She's counting. Just listen to that Here, Nudger. How many electrons fit in that orbital? Two, because that's always the amount of electrons that fit in an orbital. Make sure you spin them opposite direction. Hey, anybody, what comes after 1S? Just start reading across. Whoa. I just took y'all for a ride. It's crazy. Yeah, 2S. And now here's where you can start to get into habits, right? We already know that an S always has one orbital. One orbital always holds oppositely spinning electrons. Just like last time, after 2S comes 2p just across the gap there and just like with fluorine p can hold three orbitals but 
but make sure you follow Hun's rule. Up, 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 then down, down, down. Now, if you're sitting there asking yourself, sir, you won't know what order I drew those in. Like if you stopped there, you won't know if I went up, down, up, down, up, down or not. And you're right, but make sure you go through the process anyway um, for two reasons. If the configuration stops in the middle of it, then I can tell. And some of the questions will specifically ask about hunch rules. So just be in the habit, always be a good little chemist. Let's go talk to somebody. Let's go over to cluster four and talk to seat five. Hey, four, five. What comes after 2P? We haven't gone, gotten that far yet. 3S. Does everybody agree with 3S? We're all good with 3S. It's the next line down. Now, we've been dealing with S's. We know what they look like. An S always has one orbital. And one orbital can always hold two electrons. Ooh. How many electrons have we drawn so far? Let's check it out. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. How many more do I need to draw if I've drawn 12? We're 10 short. All right. So let's keep going. Let's go to cluster 6, C5, Aspen. What comes after 3S if you check it out? 3P. Does everybody see 3P? Yes. And just like the other P, because this is true for all the P's, a P can have three orbitals. Remember, we're 10 short, so we can fill these up safely. Up, 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 down, down, down. Hey, anybody, what comes after 3P? 4S. If you keep reading your little book, how many orbitals does an S hold? One. How many electrons does an orbital hold? Two. Spinning opposite directions. After 4S comes the worst type of movie to see in the theater. What type of movie is that? Yeah, don't go do that. There were glasses for two and a half hours. That sucks. After 4S comes 3D. We've never been here before. Let's go ask someone a question. Cluster 6, you have another chance. C2, yes. Hey, 6 2, how many orbitals fit in a D? Five, because the opening slide says so. One, two, three, four, Now you should have a little siren go off, right? Because we know that this is where we're going to stop because we know that titanium is in 3D. So somewhere in there, we're gonna stop. Now you can count, we already counted once, or you could cheat even more. Look at the 3D block on your cheat sheet. Just look at the 3D block. How many squares are there in the 3D block total? Just that block. There's 10. Verify. Do you see how there's 10 squares? Of the 10 squares, if you were to number them 1 through 10, which square is titanium? He's square number 2, which tells me I need to draw just two arrows. All right, so you can super cheat. You can know that not only is titanium in the 3D block, but he's two electrons into the 3D block. Or you can count 2 and 2 is 4 and 6 is 10 and 2 is 12 and 6 is 18 and 2 is 20 and 2 is 22. Yeah? Think you can do one by yourself? And we'll call it a week. One more and we're done, man. Yeah. Yes, I promise. All right, let's check it out. There he is, y'all. Draw the, I'm sorry, the orbital notation for silver. They're doing silver by yourself. If you get stuck, call me over.
Yeah, what happened? What if you're so wrong? I doubt it. Alright, so we're going to do silver. If you look over at silver, you would have seen that you're drawing 47 total electrons and silver doesn't live in the 3d block instead silver lives in the the 4d block why am I not going to erase my titanium data because you could just keep going one of the things I hope you've realized is that no matter what which element you're configuring, the road is always the same, right? The only thing that changes between elements is where you stop. So you would have done what Offball said and a whole bunch of poly and hund in these areas, but you would have just kept going until you get to 47. So let's fill up D. All right, after 3D, comes 
for P. P has three orbitals. Up, 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 down, down, down. After 4P comes 5S with two electrons. And then you hit that magical 4D area. Of course, a D has five orbitals. And silver is the ninth over of the 10 squares. So one up, 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 up. Down, 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 47. Hey, listen, you want to hear this. On the exam, you don't get this. You've got two weeks from now to know this, but here's the good news. There is a lot of predictability and order to this, all right? For example, one of the things that you can tell from the way that sheet is written, you know how S, P, D, and F get more complex in that order? If you were to count them off in that order as one, two, three, four, that's the first energy level that each one exists in. Y'all are gonna be pretty good at knowing that the S's are on the far left, the P's are on the far right, the D's are in the middle, and the F's are on the bottom. And as long as you know that, plus the fact that this is the first energy level that each one starts with, memorizing it becomes a lot faster than you think. Y'all have a good weekend.